virtual audience on GoToWebinar. And eventually, starting this evening, when this recording is up on YouTube, go to a potential global audience. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jay Drake Hamilton. I'm the Science Policy Director for Fresh Energy. I'm moderating this panel and also joining the panel. This is a panel of Midwesterners to talk today about bold, ambitious climate actions that are already underway in the Midwestern United States. After me will be three other speakers, and I'll show you those people, and I will be sequentially introducing them. And I would like to apologize that Governor Pritzker from Illinois had a, an emergency come up in the last couple of hours, and he's elsewhere here, and he's, he's perfectly well, um, but he's not able to join us today, so I'm sorry about that. And first of all, I want to make the case for you about why bold climate actions in the Midwest are particularly needed. And we have a graph for that, a chart, which we at Fresh Energy pulled together. And it shows you that if you examine the heart of America, the Midwest, the 12 states from North Dakota, south to Kansas, and over to Michigan and Ohio, just these 12 Midwestern states with our heavy reliance on fossil fuels use lots of energy for electricity, heating and cooling buildings, transportation, agriculture, manufacturing of steel and cement. Those 12 states contribute the most of any region in the US to our entire GHGs. And you can probably tell from that, that in order to address the climate urgency, we are going to definitely need to decarbonize the Midwest. If you take a look at this, you'll be able to see if it were an independent country, the American Midwest would be the sixth largest greenhouse emitter in the world. That means that the Midwest is critical to US ambitions to reduce emissions 50 to 52% by 2030. That's the United States nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement announced by President Biden on Earth Day back in April 22nd. Our speakers are going to be highlighting very encouraging trends and steps that are and should be taken to accelerate these trends. Fortunately, Governor Pritzker gave me some comments to say on his behalf, just a few of them, to give you a sense of where he has been nation leading in Illinois. He signed into law the bold nation leading clean energy policy that Illinois calls the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act or the CEJA. Illinois is centering communities that are most impacted by the climate crisis. In doing so, Illinois became a real equitable leader in climate and intends to be carbon free, um, have carbon free energy 100% by 2045. And I learned something from a journalist about this story. As the legislature in Illinois was debating the bill over many months, 50 Illinois legislators signed on to an equity letter stating that if they don't see climate equity in the bill, they won't sign the bill. And they stuck to their principles on equity portion. The bill focuses on immediate carbon reductions as economically as possible with equity. So I'm going to kick off these speakers and I'm going to tell you more about Fresh Energy's goals and how we're doing. 
I work for Minnesota's 30-year-old energy nonprofit, Fresh Energy. We shape and drive bold policy solutions to achieve equitable carbon neutral economies. Fresh Energy speeds the transition to a clean energy economy. We have goals similar to those of many other states, to grow good paying clean energy jobs. We want a vibrant economy and the thriving communities for generations to come. Minnesota's work started by committing to the power sector. First, in 2007, we set renewable energy standards. Since then, things have gone gangbusters. Our largest utility, XL Energy, which sells power in eight states, not just Minnesota, sells power in eight states between the Canadian border down to the Mexican border. In spring of 2019, Excel committed to Minnesota to get to 80% reductions in carbon by 2030. But less than two months later, still in 2019, Excel expanded its commitment to providing all customers in eight states by 2050 with 100% carbon-free electricity. Excel was the first utility in the nation to make that commitment. And now we're going to 0% coal plants in Minnesota. In fact, we have already retired many of the coal plants across the state. The next coal plants to close, they're all owned by Excel Energy. They will close in 2023, 2026, 2028, and 2030. Isn't that quick? Now, the last one will be closed is, is also owned by Minnesota Power, and it will retire by no later than 2035. We're very proud of this. Moving coal plants now, we're doing it now in Minnesota to what are called economic operations. That means when it is cheaper to use wind power, for example, than to burn coal, which we found out was often the case in many springs and many falls, it's cheaper to use wind power than to rely on coal. So it means you're saving your consumers lots of money. And that means that in most springs and falls, we are having the power companies shutter their coal plants. Isn't that interesting? And we find that the money is saved by so many customers across the states that no coal will be burned in Minnesota. And the economics of these seasonal operations or economic operations are now being recognized and leading to rapid disinvestments in overly expensive coal plants in neighbor states, including in North Dakota and South Dakota. That's a good, very positive trend for the Midwest. So customers are saving big money on their power bills. There are millions of tons every year of CO2 that are not emitted into our atmosphere. Another very strong good idea. Now, the legislature went out of session in early spring of 2021 and then came back in session because they realized they still had some work to do. The Minnesota legislature at that time passed two very significant, both bipartisan bills that have now been signed into law by our governor, Tim Walls. First, after four years of deliberation and advocacy, led by us and our colleagues from Fresh Energy and other organizations, Democrats and Republicans in Minnesota voted for the big Energy Conservation and Optimization Act. It's called by the short name ECO, capital E, capital C, capital O. It updates Minnesota's flagship energy efficiency laws that started the country working on energy efficiency back in the 1980s, but had not been updated for a long time. 
the eco bill allows fuel switching to electrify more of the uses things that now run on fossil fuels can often work better and cheaper by running on electricity so at fresh energy we have started using the slogan we need to try to electrify everything as soon as possible if these if this fuel switching is proven to be cheaper for customers than burning fossil fuels, you can get it new technologies. Examples include heat pump water heaters that save customers big money with huge cuts in greenhouse gas emissions, switching from burning gas or propane to heat water, switching to electricity like we do in our home. We use 100% wind energy and it costs us more you know how much it cost us in the last two years? Three cents a day more to get 100% of our energy, our electricity from wind. We love it. And the ECO Act will increase utilities investments in efficiency programs designed for under-resourced communities and households. And then here's how we found that out as our wonderful people at fresh energy they asked all the all the utilities to fill out some information requests because they knew we've been investing in energy efficiency for several decades in minnesota and we wanted to know break break broken down by um a family's income how much was spent on those that layer of level of family how much was the lowest economic um, set of families? And we were stunned to find that there was very big disinvestment in lower resource communities. And we knew that wasn't fair. So we started talking with all the utilities. And by the time the ECO Act was passed in spring 2021, I'm proud that all utilities in Minnesota voted for it because they could see the data and they could see that they weren't being fair. And get this, that means when utilities are now asked to look really hard and implement really good energy efficiency programs for low income families, they are going to be investing approximately 250% to 300% investment over time in helping low-income families get more efficient. Also in 2021, in the spring, again, bipartisan policy was passed and was also supported by every utility in Minnesota. This law is called the Natural Gas Innovation Act. It requires our regulators at the state's Public Utilities Commission to open a docket on the future of natural gas and to look at, among other things, how to decarbonize the natural gas sector. Minnesota thus joined similar future gas dockets that have now been started in Colorado, New York, Washington, and California. But we're the first Midwestern state to look at decarbonizing gas. It will substantially reduce emissions and meet and exceed the greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals at the pace and scale that the climate crisis requires. So I am next going to introduce our second speaker and I'm gonna have him come up because he likes to stand up and talk too. Yeah, which I do. Um, I don't know if you know, but in Glasgow, it's a little later in the day and it is for you in the Midwest. The next speaker is Assistant Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Transportation, Tim Sector, Sexton. And Tim Sexton is an expert on transportation and transportation fuels. Please come up. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jay. Um, and thanks everybody here and watching at home. So yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about um, some of the action happening around transportation, decarbonization in the Midwest, um, 
and in Minnesota more specifically. I think a lot of what um, I'll be sharing today are things that are happening in Minnesota, um, things that are happening around the Midwest, and one of the some of the reasons why Minnesota might be considered somewhat of a bellwether within the Midwestern region. Um, you know, I think we have a, do have a long history of piloting new ideas, trying new things um, that we're trying to leverage in the transportation sector. So, notably in transportation, excuse me. When you think about greenhouse gas emissions, so Jay showed earlier a slide, the, the importance of the Midwest to national emissions. Within that, um, transportation though is number one, both within, within Minnesota and across the country, also across the Midwest. Within that sector, what we call the transportation sector, it's important to, that uh, this is cars, trucks, buses. These are the things that are traveling on the road, but it's also boats, trains, planes, gas pipelines, um, and mobile refrigerants. So I'm with the Department of Transportation, as said earlier. So our focus is largely on the on-road emissions. And that that's worth noting just because, you know, that really is 70 to 75% of transportation emissions are really those vehicles traveling on the road. So, so it's a good match. Um, and, you know, some of the things that, that we're thinking of and working closely with our colleagues on, um, when we think about sustainable, excuse me, one of the reasons why Minnesota, I think, might be somewhat of a bellwether here around transportation decarbonization is that we have a unique thing in our originating statute. So we're actually the only agency in the state, and I think perhaps the only agency in the country that in our statute that says what the Department of Transportation is supposed to do of the 15 things, one of them is actually reduce transportation, excuse me, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. So we have a little bit more leverage, a little bit more flexibility to work on some of these things. Um, and as we do it, um, this really, we do partner and work with other states to understand how actions we take can influence others. But um, so when we're thinking about sustainable transportation, we really view it as sort of a table, a sustainable transportation table, with four, four legs that hold it up and keep it sound. And we really need all four of those to have a sturdy table from which to build a sustainable transportation future. So, you know, we talk about one of those legs is really vehicles. So done a lot of work, Governor Walls last year, adopted what we call clean car standards, but really this is adoption of the low and zero emission vehicle standards to increase the supply of electric vehicles primarily in the state of Minnesota. We also have Another another leg of that metaphorical table um, is around fuels. And so one of the actions we're taking right now is to explore the potential for a low carbon fuel standard in the Midwest, um, in Minnesota, but um, with the idea being that anything that would happen in Minnesota could be adopted by neighboring states. And there's a lot of interest in neighboring states, but some concern about who's gonna go first in the Midwest. And so while we haven't committed to that just yet, we're taking active steps at the direction of the governor to really explore that and work with stakeholders to understand the potential to do so. Vehicle miles traveled is another leg of that table and understanding what are those options that we can, we can take, what are those investments that we can make to promote walking, biking, transit, to make those a realistic option to driving alone. So that means making those choices reliable, affordable, safe, convenient, to make it a real choice for users of the system. This also has a strong equity component. Not everybody can afford a single occupancy vehicle, and our system has largely and traditionally been designed for cars. And so thinking differently about how we're making investments to be more equitable um, and not so focused on the, the car is really important. And the last sort of leg of this table is really around operations, and this has to do with everything from how we price our system to how we build it. And so we're looking at ways to capture carbon in our, in our cement pavements, looking at ways to do more recycling of pavements, looking at ways to use our existing system differently to take advantage of what we really can consider a scarce resource and how do we allocate that resource in a way that is very efficient, cost-effective, and equitable. And I mentioned equity a couple of times. The last thing I wanna say on this, this whole table metaphor, because we have to finish this one out, is that legs on a table still need bracing. And we consider like, really the way we think about it is that equity and justice has to be considered in all the work that we're doing. 
And that's really those braces that connect the legs to make this a really a sturdy table, again, from which we can build for the future. So that's all well and good. I guess one thing, though, I wanted to more specifically highlight is a recent effort to work specifically with our Midwestern partners. So about a month ago, Minnesota and Michigan co-led an effort called Rev Midwest. And we worked with state partners in Minnesota, um, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan, in a bipartisan states to work with those governors to sign an MOU where we agreed to work together with a focus on electrifying freight and medium heavy duty vehicles um, to that prior, in a ways that prioritize equity, um, pollution reduction, so clean air and water, um, but takes advantage to of our the Midwest competitive advantage of, as a freight and logistics hub. So how do we take advantage of all the work that's been done in the Midwest, the location of all these freight and shipping companies, along with some really some of the country's premier large research research um, universities. So this group is gonna be working together. Um, I think what's really exciting though is that it is bipartisan. It has a focus on freight and it positions the Midwest to really lead, especially now with the signing of the federal infrastructure bill on Friday. And we've already heard from members of Congress, along with folks from the USDOT, that they're, they're excited about the Rev Midwest compact and that they expect that there will be additional opportunities for states who are engaged in these multi-state efforts really because it gives us the potential to make more cost effective and strategic investments across states because the users of the system don't care if they want to drive from minneapolis to chicago or chicago to detroit they want a seamless user experience and given that we have limited resources it doesn't make sense to have a bunch of chargers on the borders of each state right let's make this let's be strategic let's use our investment and make investments wisely um, and in a way that makes sense and then let's also address some of these outstanding questions about the freight sector and electrification because it's not like light duty vehicles. It's not like the cars. A lot of new investment, a lot of different thinking needs to go in to electrifying trucks. Um, and so we're gonna be working together to do that. And I think it's really exciting and it reflects sort of this, this spirit of collaboration that exists within the Midwest, along with a commitment to decarbonization, equity and pollution prevention. So I think that's just one area I wanted to highlight. Happy to share some more if we have time during the questions, um, but otherwise just appreciate appreciate the opportunity today. Thanks a lot, Jay. Thank you, Tim Sexton. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce one of the most talented of our legislators. There were many talented legislators at the Capitol in Minnesota. And um, her name is Representative Patty Acom, and I'm going to have her come up again in a few minutes, but I'd just like to say a few things about her. She's going to tell you all about her great district, but all I'll tell her is she grew up in Minnetonka, Minnesota, and she now represents. Do you represent all of the city? No. Okay. Well, she'll clarify that for you. Um, and um, I'm going to be asking her later some questions because I know this is her first COP, right? And I want to find out what she's learning that she's going to take back to the legislature and help on more aggressive climate action. But please welcome Representative Patty, Patty Acom. Well, thanks, Jay. Um, it's the whole you know, glasses and headphones and masks. This is kind of a complicated setup. I'm not used to that. I like things easy. But hi, everybody. I'm Representative Patty Acom. I represent uh, House District 44B in Minnesota. And that is part of Minnetonka, part of the city of Plymouth, and the community of Woodland. It's the western suburbs of the Minneapolis area. And um, as Jay said, it's where I grew up. I'm actually, you know, side note, um, I live in the house I was born in. I came back um, with my children and um, we are now, I raised them in the house that I grew up in as a child. So um, I've come full circle in life, um, back to where I started. But um, I'm really happy to be here. As Jay said, it's my first cop. And so what, um, I, 
when you don't know what to expect, you don't know what to expect. And so it's been um, a little overwhelming. So much is happening and so much to, to learn and be a part of. So I'm thrilled to be able to be here and to share it with all of you um, here in, in, our, in the room as well as back in Minnesota. Um, so as, as Jay said, um, I'm in the Minnesota House. I am chair of the House Climate Action Caucus. And um, we formed the caucus um, a year and a half, maybe two years ago, because climate is such an important issue that really um, spreads throughout um, most, much of the work that we do in the legislature. And so um, we really look at everything in a um, kind of multi-sector approach. And um, Commissioner Sexton talked a lot about transportation. And so I'm not gonna go into that. He's the expert and, and um, there's nothing I can say better about that. So we um, have heard some great things and, and Minnesota is really doing great things in, um, in transportation. Um, and Jay talked a little bit about things that we have passed in Minnesota, and we have passed some really great things over the years. And just recently, um, we've, we've passed some really good things. The Eco Act is certainly one of them. Um, but in, in Minnesota, there's some things that we're still working on. And um, we, years ago, passed a, a um, bill um, setting up the Next Generation Energy Act, which set some greenhouse um, gas emission reduction goals. And um, we, it's time that was um, based on, it was fact, actually passed by Senator Ellen Anderson, who's here in the room with us today. Um, and, and it was passed on the best science at the time and it was really kind of nation leading. And um, we know more now. And um, so we, it's time for us to update those greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. And so a bill I introduced last year was the Next Generation Climate Act because it is time that we um, update those goals. We need to meet them. We all know how important that is. And, um, and we need to be holding ourselves accountable for those actions and, and um, making sure that we're doing it in an equitable way. Um, so that's something that we will continue to work on. It um, was, as I said, introduced last session, um, hasn't passed yet, but we'll, oftentimes it takes things a little while to get past. So we'll keep working on that. Um, and uh, we, I will say in the electricity sector, one of the things, another really big priority for um, Minnesota and legislators and even the governor is the 100% um, clean energy bill. And um, we, in Minnesota, we, as those of you from Minnesota know, are the only state in the country that has um, truly divided government. And so um, Jay was talking a lot about kind of bipartisan efforts that have passed, which has been really important. And, and that's how we can get things done in Minnesota right now. And so um, this, the 100% clean energy bill does have bipartisan support and is a, um, a top issue for the governor. And so I'm really hopeful that um, we can get that across the line this next session in 2022. So that's a the high priority. Um, and um, Commissioner Sexton talked about um, the transportation emissions, which are the highest um, per sector in our state, but it's followed really closely by agriculture. And so it's an issue that we really, as a state, um, Agriculture is a rich tradition that we have in Minnesota and one that we want to continue. And so we need to be doing more to decarbonize in the agriculture sector. And, and so today I was really um, excited to sit in on a um, panel, another panel actually that Jay was on and so was Commissioner Sexton and um, Patrick too, they all were. I wasn't there, I was just watching. But um, along with them was, um, oh, what's his name? No, I'm forgetting. Greg Downing, the Director of Sustainability from um, Cargill. And Cargill Corporation is headquartered actually in my district. And so I hadn't had the opportunity to meet Mr. Downing in person before and was really excited to hear about the really great things that Cargill is doing around agriculture um, really throughout their supply chain. And so the programs that they're working on to improve soil health and improve water quality are things that um, oftentimes started out um, as a pilot and then can be scaled up and, and used and, and implemented more broadly. And so um, I think that, you know, a lot of the work that Cargill does isn't, isn't all within our state or within our region, though some of it is. And so maybe there's lessons that we can learn from um, companies and corporations like Cargill that we can um, help implement in some of our private farmers um, to improve the, the conditions in the agriculture sector as well. 
Um, but so it's it's certainly an important thing um, that we need to be working on. And unfortunately, I don't think we're um, giving it as much attention as maybe some other sectors. And so I think it's time that we, we start looking at that. Um, and I will say in the kind of commercial and industrial and residential and even waste sectors, um, there's some, some important work that we've been working on and the eco bill is really one of those talking about, um, you know, um, conservation and um, weatherization and things that we can do to use less energy in our buildings. And um, there was also another bill that was introduced but not passed and it was a um, net zero building codes for um, by 2036. And so I think that um, there's so much, our buildings, um, we need to be doing better to pass um, bills, codes, ordinances to ensure that the buildings that we're building today are meeting up to the standards we need them um, into the future. These are long-term investments. And so the more we can be doing to, um, you know, help reduce emissions and make them sustainable, I think is really important. And, um, you know, something that um, we've all talked about a little bit today is, is equity. And it's become something that is so important. We, we know that climate change impacts um, some communities disproportionately. And so the work that we do on climate solutions really needs to focus and prioritize um, the solutions on uh, communities um, that have those disproportionate impacts. And so um, there's bills that we're working on in Minnesota that are impact or looking at cumulative impacts that um, different industries might bring to, or permits might bring to communities. And so if it's water permits or air permits, we need to be looking at all of them and that impact, the cumulative impact on the communities that they're being hosted in. And those are effects that are felt by the living, people living there. And that's really important. Um, and I, I guess I just want to wrap up just a little, um, as, as Jay said, um, this is my first COP and there's been such an um, amazing amount of um, opportunities within this building, within the blue zone and within these different panel discussions and just in having opportunities to network and talk with people that are also here. Um, and then there's been this whole other opportunity outside of these walls and there's been incredible marches and rallies that are all people that are passionate about climate change and really wanting to push those of us um, decision makers and um, legislators and electeds to do more. And, um, you know, I've been moved by by the displays of passion that are going on and and watching just how many people have been here. I have never seen crowds like this with people so um, enthusiastic and passionate. Yeah, see there, yeah, see, yeah. Representative Hornstein's here and he's he's that enthusiastic, yeah. Um, so I just really, it's been um, so, it's been such an honor to be here. And I look um, forward to bringing back so many of the things that I've learned here to, to help impact um, our situation in Minnesota and the Midwest. So thank you all. Thank you, Representative Acom. We have one more speaker. Um, his name is Patrick Hamilton and he works for the Science Museum of Minnesota. I'm gonna tell you a little funny story about the Science Museum. Now it got recognized by the state legislature, I think many decades ago. And um, the legislature was considering um, giving some funding to the Science Museum. And the guy who then was the Senate Majority Leader in Minnesota, and I'm, I'm gonna take a little traverse here. Maybe you're here because you're Midwestern, or maybe you're just trying to figure out what what makes the Midwest tick? But I'm an adoptive Minnesotan. I grew up in New York in a very rural community, in a farming community. And I got adopted here in Minnesota. And what I love about Minnesota is like most states, is they have big, very vital cities that are often very diverse and very exciting to be in because of the, um, the number of people and the types of different people there. But I also deeply love rural Minnesota because of its beauty, its productivity, its open spaces are wonderful. 
So I was really surprised to hear that the Senate Majority Leader had got up to a microphone in the Senate and said, and he came from a very small town about six hours out of the Twin Cities. And he said, to everyone who was listening, he said, I think the Science Museum of Minnesota is one of the crown jewels of our state. And just to put yourself in its place now, the Science Museum has moved now to a new facility right on the Mississippi River, and it commands a lovely view. And why Patrick Hamilton got invited to this panel is because he recently joined America is All In, and he con um, contributed to expanding America is All In to include a sector of cultural, cultural um, places. Because he said, you know, we've all heard President Biden on Earth Day when he talked about the whole of government that was now going to be focused on climate change. But Patrick was one of the people who said, well, America is all in, in trying to fight climate change, should take a whole of society approach, not just government, whole of society. So Pat, come on up and talk about what you do. And you can tell them your cool new job title. Well, thank you very much, Jay, for those very complimentary messages and the story about the Science Museum of Minnesota. I do work at the Science Museum of Minnesota. I'm the director of climate change, energy, and the environment. But as Jay was alluding to, I also have another role. I represent the cultural sector on the advisory committee of America is All In. And if you're not familiar with America is All In, it's um, find it online, all one word, America is All In. It is an enormous coalition of thousands of states, counties, cities, businesses, corporations, healthcare organizations, indigenous nations, and religious organizations, and the cultural sector. And I wanna take my time to emphasize the cultural sector because I think there's enormous potential for the cultural sector to help advance climate action in the Midwest. But it's been, uh, I think, uh, untapped to the extent that it should be. And I want to emphasize that potential through a short story about the Science Museum of Minnesota in, in three chapters. The first chapter takes place in the year 2010. And that's when the Science Museum of Minnesota contracted with a consulting mechanical engineer to do a top to bottom energy analysis of our institution. He came back several months later with a thick report, but his top of the line message was this. Like all large modern buildings in the United States, the Science Museum of Minnesota uses an enormous amount of electricity. And electricity inevitably degrades into heat. And he calculated that the Science Museum was generating 20 billion BTUs of heat energy annually just through the electricity that we were using. And like all modern buildings in the United States, that heat energy was being rejected, thrown away from the Science Museum. And then he pointed out that at the same time you're throwing away that heat energy, you are buying 15 billion BTUs of heat energy. Why are you throwing away energy and buying it at the same time? And we said, well, because no one had ever laid it out to us in those terms before. So we asked for him for a recommendation. What do you think we should do? And he said, you should put in machines that will allow you to capture and reduce that heat energy that you're now throwing away. And we said, that sounds very intriguing, but we would love to see a working example of what you're proposing. So off we went on a field trip, an hour drive south of the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul to a large food processing plant, actually a bean cannery. And before this engineer had done his retrofit of that bean cannery, this cannery had literally been dumping enormous amounts of energy and water down the drain. But what he did was re-engineer the plant so that energy and water that was going down the drain was brought from the end of the production cycle all the way to the front. Now, candidly, this was an expensive retrofit, but this bean cannery ended up saving so much energy that the payback was not years, 
it was months. And I was astonished. I went to the plant manager and said, this is remarkable what you've done. This is a fantastic story that I'd like with work with you to spread everywhere. He was unenthusiastic. And I was nonplussed, but, but it made sense. Uh, he doesn't run an educational enterprise. He runs a manufacturing plant, a bean cannery. And also, he candidly confided to me that that energy retrofit gave his plant an enormous market advantage. And as far as he was concerned, he'd like to hold on to that advantage as long as possible. Chapter two took place in 2015 when the Science Museum did its advanced heat recovery retrofit of the Science Museum. It was expensive. We spent $900,000, but we're saving $300,000 a year for a simple payback of three years. And that one act alone cut the Science Museum's carbon emissions by 30%. Act three is what has happened at the Science Museum since we did that retrofit. Because unlike the bean cannery, we've had articles written about our retrofit. We've had videos produced about it. We have had media stories broadcast about it. We have retrofitted our mechanical room with interpretive panels for the hundreds of architects, engineers, building owners and operators, uh, property developers, policymakers, and opinion leaders that have toured the Science Museum specifically to see our advanced heat recovery project. And motivated by that project, the Science Museum in 2019 committed itself to carbon neutrality. Specifically, we said, let's cut our carbon emissions by 50% by 2030, a goal, by the way, that we reached earlier this year, nine years ahead of schedule. So earlier this year, we also decided, let's adopt a new, more ambitious climate change statement that, among other things, states that every year the Science Museum will conduct an audit of its climate actions and make that public, that document public for all to review. I tell this story about the Science Museum in Minnesota because that's what cultural institutions do. We tell stories and we're great at telling stories, which is why cultural institutions are some of the most popular and most trusted institutions in the United States. Popular in fact that Cultural institutions attract hundreds of millions of visitations annually, far exceeding those of uh, professional sporting events nationwide. So here's what I propose. Let's bring funders and cultural institutions together so that cultural institutions can showcase the energy and, cult and climate innovations that we need to, in order to accelerate the decarbonization, decarbonization of the American Midwest. And in order to be eligible for funding, cultural institutions would not only need to do energy retrofits and climate innovation, but tell their audiences what they did, how they did it, and why they did it, and encourage their audiences to also adopt their own ambitious climate actions. Because imagine the economic and employment and equity and education and environmental benefits if energy innovative cultural institutions in the Midwest weren't rare, but commonplace. And we really need to convert imagination into reality. And I look forward to working with any and all of you that would like to work with me to convert imagination into reality. So thank you. And I hope this is intriguing and I look forward to the Q&A. And I'm gonna kick off that Q&A. Thank you, Patrick. And Patrick, you concluded your remarks by asking all of us to imagine potential impacts of cultural institutions being showcases of climate and energy innovation. The reason you came to COP was not so much to talk about one institution, the Science Museum, but to talk about how cultural institutions, I bet in the states you live in, where you grew up in, you have favorite cultural institutions, but probably you've never yet really thought about what more those cultural institutions could do to encourage much faster climate actions. So Pat, could you come back up and speak for another 30 seconds or another minute about how you see cultural institutions being especially useful? 
Sure, thank you. And, and obviously the cultural institutions that I'm most familiar with are those that have a science emphasis, a science focus. So when I think about uh, the Midwest, I'll just work from the east to the west. So in Columbus, Ohio, we have COSI, which draws over 720,000 visitors a year. Then in Indianapolis, in Indiana, the Children's Museum of Indianapolis draws 1.3 million people a year. And in Chicago, we have the Field Museum of Natural History and the Museum of Science and Industry together. That's 3 million visitors a year. And in Iowa, in Des Moines, we have the Iowa, uh, the uh, Science Center of Iowa, 300,000 visitors a year. And in Minnesota, the Science Museum of Minnesota, we attract about 600,000 visitors a year. So that's, a, that's just six institutions in the Midwest that together draw about 6 million visitors to their institutions annually. And they're just a part of the overall wedge of cultural institutions in the Midwest. And I'd submit that whether you're an art museum or a science center or a history center, that there is some aspect of the climate crisis that you can tell to your audiences and that I think all of these institutions would benefit enormously from any energy innovations that, for the case of the Science Museum, reduce the bottom line of our utility expenses and allowed us to direct more resources to the scientific and educational mission of the institution. Thank you. And Tim, I have a question for you. You mentioned the work in getting a regulation put into place by the administration, led by Governor Tim Walz, that we call Clean Cars Minnesota. And that was so effective, a coalition of nonprofits all over the state, not just Fresh Energy, but dozens of others who worked together as a coalition to bring Minnesotans who really cared about these emerging new electric vehicles and found out they wanted to learn more about them, and they were shocked to see that most of the electric vehicles that are manufactured for sale in America, you can find them in California, you can find them in New York and New Jersey, and you will never see one in Minnesota. So we're changing that. Could you talk for a few minutes about what you've observed about the outcry from the public wanting more and more information about these emerging electrification technologies and how maybe your agency or the Walls administration has helped build that. Yeah, so Clean Cars Minnesota, um, the Minnesota being really the first state in the Midwest to move ahead with adoption of low and zero emission vehicle standards was really exciting. and. As mentioned, uh, it was much more than just government that got that done. It was really the public nonprofit sector and the private sector working together to understand the needs of Minnesotans, what they wanted, um, and you know to really get this across the finish line. And I think the the truth is, um, for many of us working in transportation, thinking about electric vehicles electric cars, trucks, these are things that we've been thinking about a lot, uh, a lot about for a number of years. <clears throat> the general public though, it, this is these are still new to a lot of members of the public. Maybe they've seen an EV, maybe they've heard about an EV, but it continues, I think, to surprise many how few total um, people have actually driven in an EV or driven an EV. And that's important because it's a different driving experience. And not only is it better for the environment as a lower total cost of ownership, but it's fun to drive. Um, and so these are all things that I, I think, you know, this, this whole process of getting to the adoption of the low and zero emission vehicle standards in Minnesota, um, what we saw from the public was once they sat in an EV, once they had a chance to drive one, they really wanted one. And once they started to look into what was available, they were on board with this Clean Cars Minnesota because they realized how few of options were readily available in the state. And so what's really exciting about this Clean Cars Minnesota effort is that it will require auto manufacturers to bring more of those vehicles 
into the state to provide options for Minnesotans. It doesn't require anyone to buy them. It doesn't force anyone to get rid of their old vehicles, but it does you know, give people more realistic options, which is really exciting. And I think what we've seen already is the demand, once people sit down in an EV and drive one, the demand is likely to be there. So I think it's really exciting. And again, like we've been told by sort of EV advocates for a long time, it's about butts and seats. And once you drive an EV, it's really hard to go back to something else. The last thing I'll say, Minnesota, much like the Midwest, is different from some other states in that we do have large areas of rural rural communities and big big spaces between um, between cities and towns and you know jobs and education. So, you know, 10 years ago there weren't many options, there weren't enough options available. In the next three to five years, we're gonna have options available that will meet really all the needs of Minnesotans, including this and especially with trucks, which um, are really important to Minnesota uh, drivers. And so by, by moving ahead now with adoption of Clean Cars Minnesota, we're gonna be prepared to get some of that first wave of electric trucks that they come in. So it's really exciting and I think it shows a lot of leadership by the administration, by the legislature, by the public and by the nonprofit. So it's a great story of collaboration and we hope that other Midwestern states will follow very soon. Thanks. You know, when I think about this issue of how to decarbonize rapidly, the Midwest, one thing that has held us back is energy technology did not change for many years in this country and in this world. And it was only in the last five or 10 years that wind energy and now solar energy are cost competitive in many cases with fossil fuels. That's a game changer, like electric vehicles are a game changer. But these take, take people a little while to get used to and see if it's gonna work in their life. And now we see in Minnesota, 95% of people buying electric vehicles have answered surveys and 95% of them say they would never buy an internal combustion engine car again. That's good news. And I wanna wrap up this panel by talking about what I think comes next in decarbonizing the Midwest is gonna be based here in the second week of COP26. Tomorrow, I have a meeting with John Kerry, President Biden's climate envoy. Next week, I will be doing from St. Paul, a post COP26 evaluation. What's happened, what still has to move, fast, bold, and ambitious. And if you're interested, if you're listening virtually, contact me at hamilton at fresh-energy.org, and I'll make sure you get on our list for a free event. Last week, I met in the hall with Gina McCarthy. She is our National Climate Advisor to the White House. She got before a group of about 16, 16 nonprofits mostly, and said last week, we need maximum ambition from all countries on all fronts to make COP26 a success. She said the president's plans are right-sized. The US is back in, not as a leader, but as a resource. President Biden on November 1, had reaffirmed to his fellow world leaders here that the U.S. is back in on climate change. And it's not, however, as a leader yet, since it will take a long time to reestablish U.S. credibility following President Trump's hostility to climate action. But the overall tone is the U.S. government's right next door, the U.S. Senate Center, the overall tone is the US government's intent to be a better climate partner on the global stage. President Biden said on November 2nd, he said, this climate change is a challenge of our collective lifetime. It is going to be a permanent priority 
for all of many generations. And so I want to point to two things that also happened, some of them before President Biden was president, that we can play with and that buy us time immediately on the climate problem. The first is to, the, to play to the strength of the hydrofluorocarbon phase out passed by the bipartisan US Congress in December 2020 and signed by President Trump. It is the most significant climate legislation passed in our country since 2009. Under new federal law, HFCs, which is the term most people use for hydrofluorocarbons, must be reduced by 2036 by 85%. Now these HFCs are super climate polluters, super warmers. HFCs are used in refrigeration and air conditioning, used in insulating foam, blowing agencies, and propellants used in some aerosols. As nations around the world who were already in the Kigali Agreement that was managed by President Obama, until the US joined, we weren't yet working on phasing out HFCs, but now we will be. And all of those countries working together, it is assessed, will prevent 0 0.5 degrees Celsius of warming. That buys us time, of course. And about a third of the 1.5 degrees C we need to ensure. Replacing HFCs with a new generation of products that use less energy without HFCs, using alternatives that are cheaper and can be produced anywhere in the United States is a good deal. And both Republicans and Democrats got it and they passed the bill. And now, announced here in COP26, is the US new methane um, EPA rule. And 100 countries so far have joined the EU and the US in calling for a 30% reduction in methane to keep us below 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. Reducing methane emissions is essential to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. HF's, um, methane is 80 times more potent than CO2 in the first 20 years. That means deeply cutting methane is the simplest, quickest path to addressing climate action. Decrease methane to bend the warming curve to avoid climate feedbacks and tipping points. Existing solutions can cut human emissions of greenhouse greenhouse gases um, in half. Um, and half of those solutions will save money. So altogether, that buys us more time to implement the deeply cut CO2 emissions we need in the Minnesota, the Midwest, and all other places. So Tim Sexton talked to you about the wonderful, long waited for passing of the infrastructure bill on Friday. What we now need to pass is the Build Back Better Act. And Dr. Jesse Jenkins, who is at Princeton, says of the total $555 billion of investment in that Build Back Better Act, it includes funding for EVs, heat pumps, electric efficient vehicles, electric efficient buildings, clean energy, transmission, energy storage, carbon capture, and industrial decarbonation. The conclusion is, from Dr. Jens Jenkins, is that we are within striking distance of meeting Biden's 2030 emissions goal. This building better, back better, is the largest investment in energy transition the US has ever made if we get it passed. So please help us get that passed. 
and send a clarion call to Washington, D.C. to make that happen within the next two weeks. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this webinar, joining us on GoToWebinar, and the eventual um, users of YouTube of, who see us there. We welcome you. Everyone on the stage would like to talk with you. And if you contact me at hamilton at fresh-energy.org, I'll give you their email addresses because we need to get more transparent about energy and we need to talk more carefully to many more of everyone in society about climate action. Thank you so much for being here. Bye-bye.